Good morning, everybody. My name is Sue. Um, thank you very much again to uh, Karis and I and ARC uh, for inviting me to speak today. Um, I thought when I thought because Sue was going to talk a bit more about telecare, I would try and maybe uh, talk a little bit about the telehealth that we have in Northern Ireland and actually try and see whether there are actually some of the similar issues that impact the carers that we could draw across. Because some of our uses of local use of telecare is actually quite similar and we haven't really done huge innovation, I would say, in the area of telecare. So let me just talk a little bit about telehealth and how we've started with the telemonitoring service in Northern Ireland and then moving on about a little bit about the telecare, some of the impact on the, the, of telehealth for the service users and the carers and then looking forward what we would like to do moving forward from, from uh, what we currently have today and then maybe learning, picking up on some of the points that um, Sue had uh, alluded to earlier on. So I talked about the telemonitoring NI service. Some of you here, and, and I see some familiar faces here, have been actually involved in, in the telemonitoring service from its in inception. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, in <coughs> 2011, uh, the Department of Health commissioned a regional telehealth uh, service for all of the trusts within Northern Ireland. So as you can see, it's all the five trusts, and it was led by the, at that time, called the European Centre for Connected Health, but we're now called the Centre for Connected Health and Social Care, and we're part of the Public Health Agency. And the contract, again, the services that we provide comprises both of telehealth and telecare, and it has the capability to provide up to services up to 3,500 patients per annum. We monitor different, uh, 12 different condition categories, and actually more, and I'll, I'll allude to some of that later on. Again, the monitoring period, we wanted to allow people to be monitored from a short term to a longer term, again, for various uh, purposes, and will allow us, the investment that we put in will allow us to have at least up to 2008, 2.8 million monitored days. So what is telemonitoring? Um, again, loosely, for, again, bear with me if, if you're really familiar with this, but for those who are not, Telehealth really allows us to remotely monitor patients who are not at the same location as the healthcare provider. You put really monitoring devices um, that monitor vital signs. Results of this are sent via telephone to the service provider, as you can see. And then it, it allows, um, we think, uh, uh, allows patients to be able to avoid tra sorry, travel and be able to perform some of the basic uh, work of healthcare for themselves. So where we are today um, in as I've said, the service was commissioned in 2011, and we are now today in 2015, so we're more than halfway through the six-year contract. Wow. We have a peop, uh, more than 5,000 users who have benefited from the use of telehealth, and at any one time, we have about 2,000 patients of varying condition who are monitored at any one time. We also have about 2,500 users on telecare. Not all um, the trusts have um, implemented telecare. Uh, the more the trusts which have been more active in this area and who've had a longer history uh, since maybe 10 years ago would have been the trusts who are perhaps where the clients or the service users are more located in remote areas. So generally within the southern trust area and the western trust area because their population are more you know, in, in more remote locations. So they have recognized and have been able to use telecare more widely in those areas. But we are increasingly uh, speaking to our colleagues within the Belfast Trust and the Southeastern to try and identify again more meaningful use cases that they could actually use telecare in. And again, rather than me preempt some of the, the, the work that's going to be done, we have also commissioned uh, Queen's University to undertake an evaluation both quantitative and qualitative uh, studies to be conducted, which will again look at some of the aspects of how the, the service has been benefit, beneficial to both the users as well as the healthcare professional and the system as a whole. So again, we hope we will hear some updates um, towards the latter part of the year. Again, I'm going to draw a little bit about some of the initial feedback, uh, share some of the initial feedback we've had from some user satisfaction survey that we've got on how it has um, helped the patients who have been on. So again, as you can see, they're very high. The patients themselves are very generally quite satisfied with the service. 
they have, um, I suppose, reinforced some of the reason that we have put in the service and, and that they, they have indicated high percentage of um, the equipment being able to benefit them on a day-to-day -day basis as well as um, help them to manage their care. Then in 2014, April 2014, um, the Patient Client Council uh, did also a user perception study uh, of nine people that they wanted to undertake to just get an early insight into some of what they have, the experiences of the various people who have used the telemonitoring service. So nine patients were interviewed. Um, again, the service has two different modes, track and trend and triage. Triage really basically applies to um, patients who require daily monitoring and their vital signs then are sent to a, a central monitoring center where a team of nurses are regularly checking those readings. Whenever they're alerted, then the triage team would actually contact the individuals to try and really understand the reasons behind some of the parameters being breached. So those, that will be the triage model, which are mainly focused on patients who have more serious conditions that require more intensive monitoring. And then track and trend are mainly for patients who are not, um, does not require that degree of intensive monitoring, but you just want to put for the professionals and the patients themselves, they just want to build a picture of what their vital signs are like so that they, the professionals and themselves can adjust the care plan and know how to actually manage their condition over a longer period of time. So there were two categories. And again, the patients have come from both uh, those with um, COPD, heart failure, stroke, and weight management. Age range, again, between younger to actually those which are uh, on the kind of um, 65 to 75 cohort. And again, um, three, to six, uh, three females, six males. Some of you may have reports. Um, there are copies of the reports at the back there. And again, there's a PDF version if you want to get into the details. So I'm going to just touch on a little bit on some of the benefits that they have found. Again, they mirror some of the, the benefits, mirror some of the, what we've done on, uh, on the user satisfaction survey in that the same you know, um, benefits have uh, emerged. Less travel, uh, more the patients feeling that the healthcare professional will be, would be kept better informed about the condition. They're feeling more reassured, feeling of work being well supported, better channels of communication with the healthcare professional, <coughs> greater understanding of the condition and how it affects them. And again, that leads to obviously better self-management of the condition. And I want to draw a couple of the comments just to show how the individuals have benefited. And again, maybe draw some reference of how the carers themselves have had uh, our, our, the impact on the carers themselves. So in this particular one, um, they talk about save them from going to hospital and you know, the, the need to, to make arrangements to travel there. And again, in the bottom one, uh, it's a stroke patient. And again, you know, for stroke patients, the impact of the condition, because it's quite a sudden um, can change in, in, in their lifestyle. So they are obviously, um, well, maybe somebody who's able to drive previously, now no longer able to drive. So they're very dependent all of a sudden on other people, carers and family, to actually take them to hospital. So I can, again, having something like this um, would actually benefit the carers as well. Again, some of the uh, ones that indicate how they improve their care. I particularly like the one with the track and trend for diabetes. Uh, if anything, the telemonitoring helps my daily routine and creates a bit of self-discipline. I now want to know what my blood is and what my weight is. I set myself targets, for example, of losing five kilos. And now that I've done that, I want to lose another five. So again, it's, it's, it is subconsciously there because they're now receiving the information about their condition they're able to actually use that information to self-manage and set plans for themselves. So th that was quite an interesting um, development. And again, another patient story um, where, from the patient's perspective, they have collected all that information, and it's very good to see a new doctor to show all your results in the last month. So again, they feel quite empowered. They can go and talk to their clinician because they have all that information. All the family think it's very useful and always ask about my readings. It's reassuring to them. So again, the impact, the reassurance and the laying of anxieties 
from the family and the, the people around them and actually quite useful insight again. I now want to show you a case where a carer is, is uh, two cases of actually um, where the carers themselves are involved in the actual monitoring. So in this particular case, uh, Mary is, Marie is supporting Michael who is a diabetes uh, patient with diabetes um, and she's helping and again you can see before then there were lots of things that she herself as the carer not being educated about the condition is now gradually becoming more aware through the use of the information again. So again, he was in and out of hospital, they couldn't keep a track of it, she wasn't able to support him. And again, once the telemonitoring took place, you know, she could see it, she could plug it in you know, and send it, and then she could see what, what the results are. And again, their recommendation has been, it's really helped them to take control. And because she's the primary carer, she feels she's the only one doing it, but with the support of the service and in conjunction with other carer groups, she feels she, that the telemonitoring service has again been able to support her in taking care of her, her husband. You might find the, the second case I want to draw your attention to is again where a daughter is providing support to her mother. Um, again, you might find some of this in some of your paths on the case study. Uh, but I, this is a case of Sarah, uh, Sarah Spence who suffers from diabetes and um, chronic heart failure and has multiple comorbidities really. So her daughters, there's five of them, they take turns to look after her and again I'll let uh, the daughter um, speak for herself. So bear with me, just to allow you to have a bit of variety, not just to hear from me. <laughs> my name is Sandra Spence and I care for my mother Sarah Spence at 24 hours a day and the from the telemonitor put in, we've had it in for about two years now. And from the father then that he's helped us in a lot of ways to keep the mummy in the hospital. And then from we have had it in we've known her every day and so we know when her ill her illness is getting worse. Um, mummy has so many illnesses. So getting telemonitor in has helped us in so many ways because it covers all her illnesses. And we work with people who throw like her diabetic nurse, her heart failure nurse, and her virtual ward nurse. And before we got it in, we bought this up and down, up and down to the hospital with flail uh, on her lungs and the chest infections. But now we have to even keep her at home because we know when she's developing the chest infection. Take her from home readings every morning at 9 o'clock, and we take her blood pressure, her temperature, her weight her oxygen levels on her heart rate. And then it's put through on the way she is in the world. Having to tell my mum on her end because help take all the stress out of us all. I didn't mum to you, knowing that she would stay at home and her son would keep me check on her readings every day. Okay. So again, this is a, 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 a get. so two cases where the carers have been able to use and I think gain knowledge from the information that they're getting from the telehealth to actually support the person that they're caring for and again being able to engage better with the healthcare professionals. Okay. Moving then to professionals, okay, healthcare professionals. Now, whilst we have had, obviously, from the patient's perspective, we know they like it they find benefit in using it. Um, some of the professionals have been professionals, healthcare professionals views have been mixed. And again, where they have been positive, they have indicated that it has changed clinical practice. It's allowed them to deliver more efficient and effective services, better patient self-care, and again, direct their time more towards those who need it most. We've done, again, simple, uh, you know, quick kind of uh, understanding of some of the background information, we found that at the point of discharge or clinical review, 83% of cases have reported to be partially or fully uh, achieved the planned clinical outcome. However, having said that, and some of my other colleagues here will be able to attest to this, not all have found that telemonitoring do add significant, va significant value. So some of the reasons are we don't know, really know what to do with the additional data or this is adding to addition, uh, more of my work and we're, and we're actually having to do this over on top and we're, we, we can't find suitable patients to do this. So again, those are the challenges, like all new innovative services, 
we continue to encounter perceptions and challenges in, in terms of trying to get buy-in from healthcare professionals. So we're still working there. Um, on the telecare side, um, again, very similar, the, as I've said to, be, to you before, our use cases have been in where dwellings with, are remote and where um, areas where people require additional support. So and those other trusts, again, very similar. We have all the similar range of, of uh, sensors managed by a call alarm center, um, and that's applicable across different parts of Northern Ireland. Again, some of the use case scenarios are very similar to what um, Sue had alluded to earlier. So again, you, looking at risk of falling, you know, whenever you have all your PIR sensors by staircases, can detect if they're uh, approaching the staircase. And then again, some of the falls detector can actually help to prevent or at least support the individuals. Um, so again, very similar. We found those similar use cases, but again, we haven't done a lot of in-depth. The individual trusts have done their own studies and have actually uh, progressed more with them. But we are, again, as part of our evaluation, we'll be doing some uh, indication of, of where the use cases are within Northern Ireland. So having, I'm just looking at time here, having gone through some of the, just very quickly, really a snapshot of where we are, in terms of all the vo both the telehealth and telecare services. Um, post-2017, why am I interested in post-2017? Because the contract, as I've said, is a six-year service. So we have an opportunity to shape the service coming forward to us in the future by learning. That's why I wanted to, very interested to hear some of the thoughts that, that Sue has shared with us today and some of the results of the evaluation we hope will, will give, again, us additional knowledge about what the future uh, might hold for us. We know that between the period 2011 15, uh, 11 and 2015, it has changed practice. It's enabled innovation. We have, tr um, this, although they're not included in the study, we have ventured into weight management using um, the telemonitoring service because the weighing scales allow people to look after, you know, weight, take their weight at home not have to go to a public place or in a hospital clinic to have their weight taken. And again, this is quite pertinent to people who are, who are on, on the obesity, um, being looked after from, from an obesity perspective. So those are quite important. We also have used the weight management for maternal, maternal obesity projects. Again, saving the individuals having to travel to hospital to once a week or once every month to have their weight taken. So again, they get their readings done um, at home and then the healthcare professional is able to see the trend and actually be able to educate them or actually even support them as, as they go through that. We're using it in renal. Again, in some of the trusts, they're using it in renal for blood pressure monitoring to help titrate their medication. So while the platform is there, we're opening it up for people to start innovating, using it in different ways, trying to learn from what this additional information how this additional information will actually help them. And so we're trying to, to do all of that. Um, we also have the right kind of climate or the policy directions that is coming along that we think will actually help lend weight to, to what we hope to do in the future. The advent of new technologies, and again, we know um, mobile phones, I tell, tell everybody, when we first started with the initiative in 2011 and got all the suppliers to go and look at the, go out to the world and tell us what the latest technologies are and come and tell us, you know, what we should be buying or procuring. At the time, not a single provider came back with the mobile health solution. And look where we are now. None of that was, was available, not a single person had. And again, it's not because the solutions weren't there, it's just that at that time, it didn't materialize. Those were not things that, you know, were, are now commonplace. And again, the whole engagement with patients and citizens, and again, I think the internet has done lots, has opened up um, knowledge and information to a whole lot of people, patients and carers and users and everybody now, you know, before you go and see your doctor, you'd probably go do a doctor Google to look at it. So it's no long, we can no longer say, well, you know, go and talk to your doctor or your doctor will tell you what's best. People are looking for the information. They are getting the information. So we, we will need to shape 
the future of the services in conjunction with patients, citizens and everybody else. So as I said, the policy directions, some of you have mentioned transforming your care, they're there. We've, just, uh, um, we've got the making life better from the public health uh, perspective, you know, dealing with inequalities and disadvantaged people, uh, quality 2020 and the e-health and care strategy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the e-health and care strategy um, in that this is, the, some of us have been looking at replacing the, what we would have previously done would be a, an ICT strategy because it would be designed to try and tackle ICT from a healthcare pr perspective. But recognizing that actually e-health now, wider than that health, has actually benefit for end users to actually use, not just for healthcare professionals, it's now called an e-health and care strategy. And again, the six objectives you will see, supporting people is one of the main pillars that we're going to try and focus using the technology for, apart from the others, which is sharing information, information and analytics, supporting change, innovation, and maintaining and improving what we have. And again, recognizing that the potential for technology to be used to support citizens, better use of data, better use of technology, social media, supporting interaction, again, being able to have discussion and exchange of information between healthcare professionals, carers, patient, supporting independence. We talked a lot about the whole use of telecare, telecare, telehealth to allow people to stay in their own homes, how we can do that better. So e-health, again, supports all this white, reform of agenda, uh, white agenda of reform, reform self-management, carers, personalised care planning. Because of the advent of technology, we are in a better position to be able to tailor care to individuals, shared decision making, more integrated care and connecting communities. So, tele so rather than telemonitoring sitting now on its own, we hope to be able to use telemonitoring to allow it to support all those various strands that we talked about earlier. Independent living, health and well-being, supporting care. And like everything else, there needs to be consideration for technology, people and process. So we're going to look at what are the latest technology. We're going to be able looking at the areas that we can use technology for. So not only um, for people with long-term condition, elderly or older people, but also learning uh, people with learning and physical disability, um, younger people. Again, we need to widen the scope of the people that we think technology could benefit. And then obviously looking at all the processes rather than just the technology on its own. So what we're hoping to look at, and again, these are just ideas at the moment we're you know, looking at, um, looking at other areas of vital signs and symptoms management in terms of telehealth using some of the consumer technologies that are slowly but gradually emerging from Europe and the US. Video conferencing, again, some of the things people talk about to avoid traveling to hospital. Why can't we have Skype sessions? Why can't we have sessions that allow us to talk to our clinicians when it suits us, when actually something has actually happened and not wait till six months later? Um, again, apps and health tracking, and again, information and scheduling um, that we can learn from some of the Scandinavians. What can we do better in telecare? And again, I'm very interested in what Sue has been saying earlier, but looking at some of the social inclusion, how we can connect people through social circles and activities, um, extending it, uh, integrated service hubs, example Spain, and I'll give you a, a, a slide or two of some of the things that's being done uh, in Spain. Engaging at family and friends through Jointly. I think Steve's going to talk a little bit about the Jointly app. And then again, supporting this chart. So all those other areas we think are certainly things that we can definitely be looking into. Draw a little bit about, uh, get some attention about, about some of the other developments that other countries have done. We had a visit from Barcelona Provincial Council to our telemonitoring center. And they have really developed a, a at scale, uh, in the sense they had, uh, they started with giving their older population like a membership card, like a f you know, which they just pay a fiver or, or something like that a month, and then within with that membership card, they would have got all the basic um, telecare equipment that they would have got at home. And what they've done is they also then, sorry, from there have 
recognize the need for responder service, so they actually have a mobile units that they can actually go and respond to people, maybe on non-emergency, but you know, kind of as a responder. Uh, they've obviously got, again, different types of, of uh, sensors. They've incorporated some of the solutions, uh, mobile solutions, and then they you know, have tried to, to link more with their local social services. Uh, this is coming from a provider perspective. And again, their local services then is, is more a personalized uh, system, not just a service of emergency, a preventative. They would, for example, have told us that they would say in, in the summertime when they have really quite bad heat waves, they would work in conjunction with their public health uh, colleagues to do reminder services to the, their clients to ask them to drink more or you know, to, to maintain the hydration or during the winter seasons where there's requirement for an you know, increase of flu vaccination, again, they would make calls to, to remind their, their clients to actually go for those flu, flu jabs. And again, um, they would also have good morning calls and things like that, birthday calls, just to kind of keep in touch and actually, as Sue has said, build the relationship with the individuals to then be able to you know, schedule appointments for them as well if they need to do hospital appointments or they have and not able to do all of that, and that is growing as part of their offerings uh, in Spain. So, some of our challenges, obviously, as you will know, um, like our all new services, we have to obviously challenge changing work change work practices and behaviour. One of the things that we know, if we're trying to allow lots of different things to talk to each other, will be the whole interoperability. We still have the, that's still a very big issue. So that you know, an Apple, if you have an Apple app and something else come on a, an Android, they might not talk to each other. So how do we how do we get all of that to be sorted out? Integration of systems and data, ID assurance. Again, if we're going to allow people to log in and look at the data, how do we ensure that we know who they are um, and standards? So some of our key messages today. My key message today is really we are on a good foundation. We're off to a good start, but there's still much scope for improvement. There's lots of learning and sharing between all of us. We already have stronger policy that actually is hoping to drive e-enabled change, and we're ambitious for the future, and we need to keep on at it. Okay, thank you.